I'm really honored to introduce um, a true friend to teachers, a true friend to students, um, former Secretary John B. King Jr., who's now CEO of the Education Trust. If you're not familiar with the Education Trust, it's a national nonprofit organization that works to identify and close opportunity and achievement gaps from preschool through college. Um, the Secretary served under President Barack Obama, and he was the 10th U.S. Secretary of Education. And I just really like this quote from his biography. Um, President Obama called um, Secretary King an exceptionally talented educator, citing his commitment to preparing every child for success and his lifelong dedication to education as a teacher, principal, and leader of schools and school systems. We've been really privileged at No Kid Hungry to have some really great conversations around access to school meals. Um, and, and the Secretary really sees the connection between access and um, all of the other things that he's passionate about in his work, um, in his career as an educator, and then also with his work at the Education Trust. Before becoming the Education Secretary, Dr. Uh, Secretary King carried out the duties of the U.S. Department, U.S. Deputy, Deputy Secretary of Education, overseeing all policies and programs related to pre-K through 12 education, English learners, special education, and innovation. In this role, he also oversaw the agency's operations. He joined the department following his tenure as the first African American and Puerto Rican to serve as U.S. State Education Commissioner. Yeah. <laughs> Secretary King began his career in education as a high school social studies teacher in Puerto Rico and Boston and as a middle school principal. Can I share a funny story that you shared with me? I don't know, we didn't talk about this before. But he told me, I think when you were working at the department, one of your former students had some high position and she said, can you get me a White House tour? And he said, sure, I'll get you tickets for you and your mom. But he wanted to bring, she wanted to bring her chief of staff because that's how far she had come up. So I thought that was kind of cute. Um, and I think that this is a really great part of, Dr. K of Secretary King's work. He lives in Silver Spring, but he's a public school father. His, his wife is a former educator, and he's very active in the community. I know that I, I live in the same county as he does, so I know that he's active um, in every positive way to support public school in that community. So please welcome Secretary King. <laughs> thank you all so much. Thank you, Bree, uh, for the introduction. Thank you to No Kid Hungry for sponsoring today's conversation. Uh, this is a community that I love to spend time with, so thank you all for the opportunity to spend a little time with you today. Um, we're going to have more of a conversation. I want to get to that, but I want to take a few minutes to frame what I think are some of the challenges we face and some of the opportunities we face at this moment. You know, I always, when I was a teacher and a principal, I did not like the end of the school year because I always felt like at the end of the school year, you have the things on your list that you didn't quite get done. You have all these goals that you didn't quite exactly accomplish over the course of the year. I prefer the start of the school year because you haven't made any mistakes yet, right? Um, but this year has been a particularly hard school year. And it's important to acknowledge how hard it was. It's important to acknowledge that it's a school year that began with the KKK and Nazis marching across a college campus. A school year that saw countless school shootings where young people took to the streets because we as the adults have failed them, failed to protect them, failed to keep them safe from guns. It's a school year that saw our kids sitting in class scared about whether or not their families might be deported. Kids who are undocumented worried because the administration has withdrawn DACA protections, worried about whether or not they will be able to continue their education or enter the workforce. It's a school year in which we have had countless incidents of African Americans having the police called on them just for living their lives sitting in a coffee shop, taking a nap in one's own dorm, 
Right? That was this school year. This school year was a school year where folks in Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands faced a terrible hurricane and then a man-made disaster. A man-made disaster, the failure of the federal government to protect our citizens, the failure of the federal government to take care of the people there. There are folks in Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands who still don't have water and power today, 10 months since the hurricane. And so when we think about how all of this affects our kids. I think about how it affects my 12-year-old and my 14-year-old. I think about how this affects all of our kids in class. The fear that they sit with. The fear that they sit with when they hear our political leaders use divisive rhetoric targeting people on the basis of race or gender or LGBTQ status. I think about how hard it is for us as educators to create a space that is truly safe for kids when they're exposed to what is really a national trauma of divisiveness and discord. And so it, at those moments where it's so hard, we have to ask, well, what is our role? What is our responsibility? How do we go forward from here? Because we must for the sake of our kids. And so I want to suggest five important ways that I think we, we move forward together. One is to acknowledge how hard this all is for all of us. Uh, I was in Austin, Texas a few weeks ago for a conference around socio-emotional learning and folks were there from Tacoma, Washington who were working on a socio-emotional learning district-wide project. And one of the things they do in this project in Tacoma is when kids are confronted with something that is challenging academically, something that's hard for them that they have to persevere through where they need to get help from peers, they refer to it as emotional labor. The act of persevering through tough challenges, believing a positive outcome is possible, and supporting your peers as they work alongside you until the ultimate goal is achieved. Talking to a student who's scared that ICE is going to come to their house, that is emotional labor. Helping young people to navigate the hate that surrounds us, that is emotional labor. Everyone in this room has been engaged this school year in emotional labor. It is hard. We have to acknowledge that. And we have to then take care of ourselves. And so the first point I want to make is around the importance of maintaining our hopefulness in taking care of ourselves in a context in which we are engaged in emotional labor. I think about a story that... Um, was shared by Julian Bond, who was the leader in the civil rights movement. Julian Bond t shared this story about his grandfather. His grandfather had been enslaved in Kentucky, uh, born into slavery, walked across the state of Kentucky with his steer to uh, Berea College, used the steer to pay for his education, got his education, and was then chosen to give the commencement address at his college. Think about that, having started out enslaved, barely able to read and write, going across the state by foot to get education. And when he gave his commencement address, one of the things that he talked about was the idea that, I want to quote, the pessimist from his corner looks on the world of wickedness and sin and blinded to all that is good or hopeful in the condition and progress of the human race bewails the present state of affairs and predicts woeful things for the future. In every cloud he beholds a destructive storm. In every flash of lightning, an omen of evil, and in every shadow that falls across his path, a lurking foe. But Bond's grandfather went on and he said, you know, the pessimist forgets. The pessimist forgets that the clouds also bring life and hope that the lightning purifies the atmosphere, that shadow and darkness prepare for sunshine and growth, and that hardships and adversity, and adversity nerve the race as the individual for greater efforts and grander victories. It has been a hard year. It is a year that requires all of us to reflect on what more we must do to advance social justice, but know that the struggles we have gone through require of us greater efforts, but promise grander victories, that our perseverance, our commitment to kids, our commitment to a better society will carry through. We have to maintain that spirit of hope, but we also have to take care of ourselves and each other as we pursue that path of hope. We've got to be good to ourselves so that we can be good for the work. A second 
theme I want to touch on is the idea that in order to do the work of social justice, of equity well, we've got to do it with folks, not to folks. We've got to do education advancement with folks, not to folks. That means, that means as Brian Stevenson, the anti-death penalty activist, would say, we've got to get proximate. We've got to get close. We've got to listen carefully. We've got to engage with the communities where we want to make a difference. We have to be willing to have courageous conversations. We have to listen. I think about my time as secretary. Some of the most powerful experiences I had were times when I was, that I had the opportunity to listen to many in this room, to teachers, to students, to parents, to folks on the ground facing the daily challenges. I think about being in Orlando after the Pulse nightclub shooting, meeting with a group of LGBTQ young people, talking about their experience in the Orlando community, and hearing from them, and remember that shooting was directed at the LGBTQ community, hearing from these young people their experience of being bullied at school, being bullied by other kids, being bullied by adults, heard from kids who thought about taking their own lives because of the fear that they carried with them each day in school, including fear about using even the bathroom at school. And I tried to hear them, and then we tried at the department to shape our work on educational improvement based on what they said, based on their stories, based on what we heard from them. I think about going to St. Paul, Minnesota and meeting with folks at the school where Philando Castile worked. Philando Castile worked in the school cafeteria at a public Montessori school in St. Paul. He was killed wrongly by police, police who were not held accountable for his death. And I sat with a group of parents and his colleagues and teachers at the school. He was beloved by teachers, by staff, by kids, by parents. They called him Mr. Phil. And they talked about what a wonderful man Mr. Phil was. And then we talked about race in the community of St. Paul. And one of the things that came up in the conversation was that a lot of folks, for a lot of white folks in the community, they thought things were pretty good. Things were pretty progressive. Then you heard from the folks of color in the room about the relationship with the police. You heard from folks about Philando being stopped nearly 40 times by the police in traffic stops. Most totally unjustified. And the moment where the conversation shifted was the moment where the principal of the school, a white woman, said, you know, I've lived my whole life in this community. I never interacted with police my entire life until I started dating my current husband who's African-American. And when I started dating him, then I started interacting with the police all the time in the community. And you could see the conversation shift. You could see the room change. One of the parents stopped me after the conversation and said, you know, for my kids, what they understand, a white parent, she explained, uh, they explained that for, um, for their kids, this parent felt like the message had been things were bad, Martin Luther King came, things were all better. And this parent said to me, you know, but now I see that that's not right. That I need to teach them something different. That they have to understand the complexity of race and how it operates in our community and in our country. And so I tried to carry that conversation, the lessons from that conversation into the work at the department. All of us have a responsibility to get proximate, get close, listen carefully to the people who are most vulnerable. Third, we've got to see that diversity is equity, is justice. These aren't three separate things that we pursue separately. They are one thing that we pursue together. It's more than 60 years past Brown versus Board of Education, but communities all across this country, many represented in this room, are more segregated today than they were 10 or 15 years ago. We have a moral responsibility to do something about that. We know that separate is inherently unequal. We know, we know that what happens when we concentrate kids of color, particularly low-income students of color in a subset of schools, what happens in America is we give those schools less. We've done a study at Education Trust showed that on average across this, the country we spend $1,000 less per pupil on high-needs kids, on low-income kids than we spend on affluent kids. And, and states in this room, the gaps are larger. Two, three, four, five, six, seven thousand dollars. But in fact, we, the gap is actually wider in this country around race. 
If you look at school districts by race, we spend about $1,800 less per pupil in school districts that serve large numbers of students of color versus those that serve large numbers of white students. Separate E is inherently unequal. It doesn't have to be that way. We can make different choices. The Century Foundation has done a powerful report on 100 communities around the country that have intentional efforts to achieve school diversity. We know what to do. We know that art schools, that public Montessori schools, that dual language schools, that STEM academies, we know those will draw students across neighborhood lines, across district lines. We know that if we're intentional about how we set up housing policy and school assignment policy, we can produce more diverse schools racially and socioeconomically. I live in a community in Montgomery County. I'm blessed that my kids go to schools that are racially and socioeconomically diverse and high quality. We choose to live in that community because of a 40-year commitment to diverse schools and diverse neighborhoods. I always tell folks when my daughter came off, my older daughter plays softball, and she came off the softball field once, I said to her, wow, your softball team is like a Benetton ad. And my daughter said to me, what's Benetton? <laughs> and so then I had to explain about the ads in the 80s, and they were the first ads with diverse people. But I meant it because I was so struck, just sitting there watching her team, how powerful it is to be in this community where the diversity is a natural part of our community. We can choose that. We can choose to have a diverse educator workforce. Unfortunately, we don't make that choice as a country. Majority of kids in the nation's public schools are kids of color. Only 18% of our teachers are teachers of color. That is a choice. That is a public policy choice. Systems aren't dysfunctional. Systems are designed to achieve exactly the outcome they achieve, right? So we have a system, we have a system in which students of color are less likely to graduate from high school, less likely to go on to college, less likely to major in education, less likely to graduate from college, less likely to enter the teaching profession, and less likely to stay once they enter the profession. That's about choices. We need to make different choices if we want to have schools that are diverse in the student population and diverse in the faculty and leadership, and that matters. It matters for kids of color. We know, for example, from a Johns Hopkins study that African-American students who have a single African-American teacher in elementary school are more likely to graduate from high school. It is powerfully important to see role models, but it also is powerfully important for white kids to see leaders and teachers of color in their schools and communities. We can do better. It's a question of our choices. Fourth, and I know I'm, I've gone on maybe too long, but fourth, I want to make the point that we, we've spent too much time in education on this false debate between whether what matters is what happens in school or what matters is what happens outside of school. Guess what? Kids are in both places. Both matter. Right? We want kids to have a powerful academic experience in school, a powerful socio-emotional learning experience in school, experience powerful, diverse communities in school, have a well-rounded education that's about not just English and math, but science and social studies and the arts in school. And if kids are hungry, if kids are homeless, if kids are experiencing trauma, if kids are living in communities that are affected by substance abuse and violence, of course that has an impact on them. And of course we as their educators have a moral responsibility to be activists on those issues too. We have to be activists and champions for school quality, and we have to be activists and champions for a just society in which all kids are taken care of. Now, two final points. Part of why I believe so deeply that, that, the, that we have to insist that school matters as I know it mattered for me. And those of you who know me know I'm standing here today only because of amazing New York City public school teachers who made it possible for me to have hope that I could not find on my own. My mom passed when I was eight, my dad when I was 12. It is only because of those teachers that I'm alive today. I became a teacher to try to do for other kids what my teachers have done for me. When people say, well, if kids are poor, if kids have challenges outside of school, there's nothing that can be done, I stand here as proof that that is not true. Right? That school can be transformed, schools can save lives. All of you are saving lives every day. But to say that doesn't mean we ignore the challenges that kids bring with them to school. I think about another Johns Hopkins study, a project they did around glasses. 
Now, it was a shocking study with shocking findings. If, buckle your seatbelts, if kids cannot read the book or see the board, they do worse in school. Shocking, I know. And in this study, they found if you do an intervention, give kids access to vision care, kids can read the book, can see the board, get ready for it, they do better in school. <laughs> Right? To acknowledge that vision matters is not to say teaching doesn't. It is to say that we, again, have to take responsibility for our kids as whole people. Final point I want to make is about all of us being evangelists for civic education. Now, we know from the NAEP data from the National Assessment of Educational Progress. We know that only about one in five kids have a basic knowledge of Congress, the courts, the presidency, things like how a bill becomes a law. For African American and Latino students and low income students, it's even lower, it's about one in 10 kids. We see that play out with adults. A recent survey showed only 26% of adults could name the three branches of government. Think about that. Only 43% could name a single Supreme Court justice, even though 90% said the Supreme Court is important and what they decide matters for people's everyday lives. Think about the fact that we are amongst 35 Western democracies. We rank 28th in voter participation. And I think about a study that was done recently at Stanford looking at middle school students, high school students, and college students, and their ability to discern between fake news and real news. 80%, over 80% of middle school students could not distinguish between an ad and an actual news article on, on a website. Right? We, all, we don't just have to do civic education. That's why I say we have to be evangelists for civic education. Whether you teach math or science or musical theater, I want you to show up at your school next year and say, what are we doing to ensure that we produce kids who are not only college and career ready, but ready for citizenship? We, we must, we must. This is not a partisan point. Whether you're a Democrat or a Republican, whether you're a liberal or a conservative, democracy depends on a citizenry that is informed, that is able to discern fact from fiction, that is able to grapple with difficult challenges, to think critically, we've got to make sure that all of our kids have the foundational knowledge, the skills of writing, of communicating orally, of working th through arguments, understanding and analyzing opinions different from their own, and the lived experience of engagement in community and engagement in tough community challenges. We must make sure all of our kids have that, not just for the sake of our economy, for long-term health and well-being of our democracy. So, five things. Again, one, this work is hard. Take care of yourselves. Two, get proximate. Listen to those who are most vulnerable. Three, diversity is equity, is justice. Four, it's not about community versus school. It's community and school because kids are in both places. And finally, be an evangelist for civic education. So I'll close with this. I, am, I love being with the Enstoy community because I love teachers. I know the difference that great teachers make in people's lives. I know that our democracy depends on all of you. You are quite literally the guardians of our democracy. Majority of kids in our nation's public schools are kids of color, as I mentioned earlier. Majority of kids are eligible for free or reduced price lunch. We have no future if we fail to address issues of education equity. And you, as a community of phenomenal teachers, have said, we stand for education equity because you stand for the future of our country. Thank you so much for what you do for kids. Thank you for the opportunity to be with all of you.
I'm so honored to be passed the mic by Kalisa, because she's a rock star. Would you give her a hand? I felt as I was listening to, um, by the way, let me get this, let me start it correctly, CCSSO folks. My name is Tony McNair Jr. and I am the 2017 Virginia Teacher of the Year. As I was listening to you, and what do we call you in this engagement? Do we call you Secretary King or can we? John is good. John is good? All right, thank you so much. I feel so much better. <laughs> As I was listening to you talk, I felt, I don't know about you, Kalisa, that uh, maybe we should just let you take it from here and we can just go back out there and sit. But we've, we put some, together some questions um, to kind of jumpstart this engagement. And, uh, and so I want to start with the quote before I ask you the first question. And it's a quote by the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And I know many of you have heard it before. The ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of comfort and convenience, but where he stands in times of challenge and controversy. And I think it's time for us to take a stand and our whole purpose for being here today and this week is to learn things that we can take back to our young people as well as our colleagues and develop new leaders for the 21st century. The theme of this conference is teaching tomorrow's leaders. And so with that theme, I have a two-part two part question. What are some things that we as educators need to teach leaders of tomorrow? And the second question is, how do we keep these new leaders from becoming discouraged or distracted in the face of unscrupulous attacks and the controversy that we are experiencing? Glad you started with softball questions. Um, <laughs> two thoughts. One, one is that um, I think a part of our, our role is to create space for young people to lead. Right, and that, and that we, we shouldn't think of it as something that, like there are empty vessels into which we pour leadership, but that we are creating space for them. You know, my, I think about my two daughters this year who both, after Parkland, you know, they, they chose, they wanted to be engaged in the protests, the walkouts from their school, the rallies. Uh, my, my middle school daughter who just turned 12, she started an organization at her middle school called SLAY, Socially Liberal Activist Youth. Um, and uh, so I feel like part of our task is to, is to clear a path for them, create space for them, right? So. Give, give them an opportunity to have their voice be heard, whether it's in our school or our school district or in the community. The second is, um, I think, trying to equip them with, with real civic engagement skills. Why, why I ended on this note of civic learning. You know, think about the Parkland young people. Part of why they have been so effective, and the, the young people will say this, is that they had the experience in school of doing things like debate, um, an analytical reading, and then having to debate the content of what they read, of having the experience of doing uh, service learning projects, right? They, they were in a school that, that invested in their ability uh, to be engaged citizens, and so you're seeing them then express that. And so I think we all need to think about how do we create that space for our kids, again, regardless of what discipline we teach, whether it's helping kids in math, figure out how do you read a graph and make sense of statistics, because we know statistics can be misused, right? Right? or helping kids in science see experiments as a way to test hypotheses and understand the importance of testing hypotheses and of research right? and, and the power of science to inform public policy. Uh, we all can work on that. Thank you. Give that a hand clap. <laughs> so, um, why do you think educators are not encouraging students 
to go into education. I saw a statistic in Georgia. Georgia, where are you? Oh, no, Georgia's not here. It's about 74% of educators in Georgia uh, discourage their students from going into the profession. Um, so my question is, why do you think we're not doing that? And what role should educators play in the recruitment and retention to get more people into the teacher pipeline? Well, one is pay. And I think we just have to name that and then we have to do something about it as a country, right? Um, and, you know, I'm inspired by teachers who've organized around the country, whether it's in, in West Virginia or um, in Arizona or a number of states across the country we've seen, Kentucky, we're seeing teachers organized to say we need to make sure that teachers are well paid. Um, and I worry that what we've seen over the last three decades is systematic disinvestment in public education by states, by state legislatures. We have a federal administration that wants to accelerate that disinvestment, uh, wants to send money away from public education to private schools. And so we have got to be organized. And the Supreme Court has made it harder to be organized, but nonetheless, we can't let that stop us. We've got to be organized and we have to insist on fair compensation. So that's, that's one. Um, we got to make it so that it's possible to have, you know, feed your family and have a roof over your head and pay your student loans, uh, which I'm still paying, by the way, pay your student loans, um, uh, you know, while being a teacher. So that's one. Two, working conditions. Right? And if your working conditions are bad, it's not going to make the profession one to which you want to encourage young people to, to think about. So, um, and that, that means we've got to advocate for resources for public schools. You know, I think about, there, there's just a lawsuit in Detroit challenging uh, the Detroit schools and really the state of Michigan for failing to provide even basic education to students in Detroit. And the argument was that there ought to be a constitutional right to literacy. Unfortunately, the, that's right, that's right. Um, unfortunately, the judge in this first round said there was not, but there's gonna be further litigation. Um, but when you read the complaint in this case, you hear about water dripping from the ceiling, rodents running across the floor, books that are 20 years old, copy machines that don't work, water fountains and bathrooms that don't work. Those are not conditions that in which one can be um, excited about the teaching profession and it's not those aren't conditions in which students can succeed think about baltimore this year the images of kids and teachers in winter coats because the heat doesn't work right so working conditions the second thing the third piece particularly around diversity is uh, we have to make school communities and districts where teachers of color feel heard and appreciated or teachers of color will not encourage young people of color to enter the teaching profession. Um, you know, this is something we've written about at, at the Education Trust. We did a report on the perspective of African American teachers and another on the perspective of Latino teachers. And what we heard over and over again was folks feeling devalued, um, not getting. Uh, the kinds of support that they need. Um, the assumption that if you're an African-American male teacher, I'm sure you've had this experience, I certainly have had this experience where folks assume, well, you're gonna do the discipline because you're, uh, you know, you're a black male teacher, of course, you're gonna, you're gonna be the disciplinarian uh, or you're gonna mentor all the boys who are struggling. And maybe you, maybe you wanna do that, but that ought to be recognized, that ought to be compensated, right? Uh, we heard from Latino teachers time and again folks being asked to be the translator for every family, um, which again, maybe folks want to do, but if you're doing that while somebody else is grading papers and planning lessons, that ought to be compensated and recognized. Um, we also heard folks being expected to be the voice of diversity in their school or district, you know? Um, you know, sort of like, hey, you know, hey John, what, what, you know, it's Black History Month, what are we doing this year? Uh, well, diversity isn't the responsibility of the folks of color. It's the responsibility of everybody. Yeah. So much is 
going on in my head right now based upon what you just said and the question that Kalisa asked. Uh, but in the interest of time, we'll keep moving. Um, I'm going to couch this next question based on something um, that I have felt over the past two years since I have been in this position. And that is, education is the foundation that is laid for opportunity and destiny to meet. Destiny is what is reached when hope and resilience makes dreams come true. Have you spoken about hope and resilience? And we all know that in 2016, President Obama signed the uh, Every Student Succeeds Act. <laughs> and that has opened up the intent, I believe, was to open up an avenue for community engagement and other stakeholders to uh, engage in this learning process with us. Have you seen any progress or much progress in, since the implementation? And would you speak to it? Well, the, the jury is out, I will say. I'll tell you some things I'm hopeful about. I'm glad that states are broadening the definition of educational excellence beyond just English, and math, and high school graduation. So that's right. So you've got states that are saying, you know, we're going to look at chronic absenteeism because kids who miss a significant amount of school are not going to do as well. Even the best teacher can succeed with a kid who's not in class, right? Um, you have states that are looking at uh, how students do after they leave high school, how do they do in college and careers. You have states that are looking at science and social studies, states that are looking at access to advanced coursework, whether or not low-income students and students of color get to AP and IB classes. So I do think there are um, some states that are uh, doing some smart things. I worry particularly about two things. One, that many states have put in place plans that most of which have now been approved by the education department that ignore the performance of groups of students within schools that look only at averages and the reality is you can have a school that's performing on average fine but the african-american students are three grade levels below or a school that's performing fine on average but english learners aren't getting access to a rich curriculum and aren't making real progress across disciplines, right? So, so I'm worried about that and in my view the education department should not have approved those plans. They are not consistent with the law, but obviously my views and my successor's views about many things uh, differ. Um, the other thing I worry about is that states do not say very much about what they're going to do once they have the data, right? So once we know that kids are chronically absent, what are we going to do to support those kids, their families, to, to help them get to school? If it's a transportation obstacle, if it's a healthcare obstacle, if it's an engagement obstacle, what are we doing about that? You know, if we see that students of color are vastly underrepresented in advanced coursework, are we going to change the process by which you get into those courses? Are we going to provide additional supports? What's the, what's the, what's the next step? And states said very little about that. Um, so uh, that's why I say the jury is still out. I think there are some promising indicators, uh, but there's lots of reason to be worried. Thank you. So I'm going to shift us now to a, a topic that's very near and dear to my heart, and that's on the school to prison pipeline. Arne Duncan in 2014 referred to the school to prison pipeline as the most critical civil rights issue of our time while Secretary DeVos has not acknowledged the issue even exists. So what are your thoughts regarding the school to prison pipeline? And do you believe that any progress has been made to dismantle it? Yeah. Well, I think the, over the last you know, five years, we have seen progress in some communities. And it's important to acknowledge that. We've seen nationally uh, the rate of suspension in many communities go down. We've seen uh, school districts adopt policies that are designed to rethink discipline and shift to restorative justice practices, to trauma-informed approaches uh, in schools, investing in mental health services. So that's promising. Uh, on the other hand, school to prison pipeline is very much with us every day. Um, a few statistics. 
African American students account for 18% of the kids in pre-K, 48% of the kids suspended from pre-K, four-year-olds. Right? African Americans are more, African American students are more than three times as likely as white students to be suspended from school. Uh, those numbers in many communities are even higher, four times, five times. And it's not just boys, it's girls as well. In many communities actually the, the ratio of suspensions for African American girls to white girls is actually larger than the ratio of suspensions for African American boys to white boys. Um, so the, there's a great book, Push Out, by Monique Morris, I, I recommend to folks about particularly the issue of dis, dis, disparate discipline practices for girls of color. Uh, there, we found in the Civil Rights Data Collection there are 1.6 million kids who go to a school where there's a sworn law enforcement officer and no school counselor. All right, what's, what's the message of that to young people? Right? African American students represent about 15% of kids overall, about 31, 32% of the kids who are referred to law enforcement. All right, so the school to prison pipeline is very much with us. It's also worth acknowledging, we have 19 states that still allow corporal punishment. Think about that. That means that, you know, two, three weeks ago, a teacher walked into a classroom and beat a child with a wooden object authorized by the state. Right? Something for which you would arrest an adult on the street for doing to another adult, the state authorizes a teacher to do in a classroom. So it is very much still with us. I worry that the current education department does not acknowledge the problem, really. Uh, and there was guidance that we put forward in the, in the Obama administration, jointly, the Department of Justice and the Education Department, to try to get folks to realize their responsibilities under civil rights law, but also to understand what best practices might be around changing discipline approaches. And it seems likely there's been a lot of discussion about this. Uh, the department has said they are considering withdrawing the guidance. Uh, I think given their, their track record on civil rights issues, I, I think there's good reason to think they may well withdraw that guidance which puts the responsibility then on all of us to be advocates in districts and states for rethinking discipline, for changing discipline practices. We don't have to wait for Washington, we have to do it in our own communities. I'm gonna ask one more question because uh, Khaleesi and I would also like for you all to ask John some questions and so this is the final question from us. I was looking on the website for Ed Trust, and I, I saw something that really just um, moved me. It was a statement on there that said, fierce advocates for the high achievement of all students, particularly those of color or living in poverty, equity-driven, data-centered, student-focused. Would you talk more with us about what pathways or uh, resources that Ed Trust can provide to help us do what we're trying to do. Thanks for asking that. So, you know, uh, the reason I, I decided to go to, to the Education Trust after the administration is that uh, Ed Trust is an education civil rights organization. Ed Trust stands for education equity for low income students and students of color. And we do a mix of research and advocacy. So we uh, will conduct original research to try and identify where there are opportunity gaps. I'll give you a couple examples. We did a study on AP classes and international baccalaureate classes. Oftentimes people will point out that schools that serve low income students and students of color have fewer of those classes. That is true. But it also turns out that in schools where those classes exist, students of color are dramatically underrepresented. And so if you just had students of color in proportionate numbers to their numbers in the school in those classes, you'd add hundreds of thousands of kids of color taking AP and IB classes. Right? So we try to tell that data-informed story. Uh, we've done research recently on college attainment, looking at college attainment state by state for African American and Latino students. Many states have set goals saying, you know, we're going to get to 60% of our adults having college degrees. There is no way they will meet those goals unless there is a targeted effort to address the gaps in completion for African American and Latino students. 
For every 10 white students who start college, six will have graduated six years later. For every 10 Latino students who start college, five will have graduated six years later. For every 10 African American students who start college, only four will have graduated six years later. Those gaps must be closed. So part of our work is around identifying the gaps. Part of our work is organizing civil rights groups, immigrant rights groups, disability rights groups, parents, educators, uh, business leaders in states to put pressure on governors, state legislatures, state commissioners, state boards to address issues of education equity. So insisting, for example, that in an SS state plan, the state include things like suspension so that we can take on the school to prison uh, pipeline. You know, one thing I would offer is on our website at trust.org, we have a ton of interesting resources, including some tools for looking at how well the curricula in schools are lining up with higher standards. We've done a bunch of analysis of districts that say they're doing lots of writing, but then when you look at all the assignments, kids are only uh, doing more than a sentence or two of writing 6% of the time. Right, so we've got some very practical tools, uh, but we also have a newsletter, an equity newsletter that we send out regularly so that folks can be informed around civil rights issues that are coming up in, in education and states. Uh, so I hope that we can, I hope this, this conversation is part of an ongoing relationship where we can partner together. Okay, so at this time, uh, if there are any questions from the audience, Jamela Coase will take them. You may just raise your hand. Are there any questions? So what we'll ask for you to do, since we just have the one running mic, what we'll ask for you to do is come up to the podium and we'll have about three people at most up here and I'll just tap you whenever it's your time to go. So if there are three people right now who would like to go ahead and line up. So questions. I saw one, two. Come on up. One, Abdul was the second one. Oh, and Brett, yes, please, All right. come on up. Hi, my name's Christina. Um, I'm a teacher in Philadelphia, and I really love the fact that you brought up community and schools, because I really believe in that connection, but I find that the community doesn't always value our role and doesn't always see us um, as an integral part. And so what is your suggestion to us to bridge that more and for how do we get families more involved? How do we get that um, level of respect or want to have families want to come out to us? Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's it's hard, particularly, you know, if folks are working multiple jobs, if folks have other challenges, if folks have multiple kids, right? Like, we have two kids, both my wife and I work. We have a ton of resources, right? And it's still stressful when there's a PTA I meeting, like, who's gonna go? Or how are we gonna get the kids dinner? You know, right? So that's hard, and if you are experiencing poverty and all the challenges in high needs communities, that is, all that is harder. So what I, what I would try to do as a principal, and what I say when I'm talking with principals about this is, we have to come up with every way possible to lower the barriers for folks, right? So when we did parent meetings at my school, we would provide childcare and food, because if you take out the worry about how is everyone gonna get dinner tonight, that makes it easier for folks to come to a meeting. Uh, we would do meetings in the community, right? So at a library or, you know, because we had folks from different neighborhoods whose kids were at the school where I was a principal. Um, we put the homework on the voicemail of the school every night. It's gonna seem like a small thing, but I would tell you, being a middle school principal, I was able to stand up and say to all my middle school parents, there's gonna be homework every night. Your kid is gonna say, and now I live this as a middle school parent, your kid is gonna say, I forgot the homework, I lost the homework, can I call my friend for an hour to get the homework? Right, we had a substitute, I don't know if we, I'm not sure we had homework. And I said, when your kid says that, don't worry, call the voicemail of the school, the homework is gonna be there, it's gonna be read aloud by the uh, office manager and you'll hear the, the homework. I had a kid whose mother could not read. Kid filled out every form, that ever was filled out for that family at the school. And the mom said to me when her daughter was graduating, 
that the homework hotline was the first time she'd ever been a part of her kid's academic experience at school. Because she would call the homework hotline, she would listen to the assignments read aloud, and then she would have her daughter present the homework, and she would know if her daughter said something that didn't match what was on the homework hotline, uh, and, she, and then she could hold her daughter accountable. And, and it was just, for her, just such a blessing to be able to participate. So I think part of the work is how do we, how do we lower barriers? Um, and, part, and, and part of the work is uh, helping to ensure that all of the staff are comfortable and have a good sense of how to work with uh, families. You know, I would say when I did my teacher training, which was very good, I went to Teachers College at Columbia, I had a great experience, I learned a ton of things. We never talked about parents, not once. First time we have parent-teacher conferences, I always tell this story, my, my principal said, hey, parent-teacher conferences tonight, good luck. <laughs> and I thought, I have no idea what happens in a parent-teacher conference. I never been to one, I never learned about it in school. I thought, well, I remember on Growing Pains when Kirk Cameron <laughs> got in trouble and Alan Thicke had to come to school, right? And this is Robin Thicke's father for the young people in the room. <laughs> Alan Thicke had to come to school. And so I did, literally, I thought to myself, growing pains. So the desks were pushed against each other. There was a stack of papers in front of the teacher. She looked stern. So I pushed two desks together and put a stack of papers. I didn't have to do with anything. I just had a stack of papers. And as each parent came in, I would stack my little papers and I'd look stern because that's what I thought a parent-teacher conference was. So I think we have to do a better job uh, as a sector making sure that all educators are prepared to work effectively with parents as well. Thank Thanks. You. Yeah, yeah. Um, I also want to give a resource as Abdul makes his way to the mic. Uh, Remind, the Remind app is your best friend. That's your way that you can text message your parents and your students without them having your phone number and that will build relationships. And one other thing, uh, Ricardo Castro from Illinois uh, set up a program called uh, uh, Familias Unidas where they actually go into the communities. They charter a bus or a van on Saturdays once a month and teach the parents uh, who are in high poverty areas how to fill out FAFSA forms and all those other things. So we have to bring the school to the community. Uh, good afternoon, brother man. Uh, as I, I teach in a charter school, so for me, I teach in a charter school in North Minneapolis. Our student population, 99% African American, 99% free or reduced lunch. We have a huge East African population, so we deal with the ELL, ESL support resources. But at the same time, we have a huge special education population, and we're right in the heart of the lowest income community, most violent community in our city, and probably in, one of, in our state. So with that being said, we don't always perform. And for me, it's cool to talk about resources, but resources don't come to schools that don't perform. So you have these, these predominantly African-American schools that funders, that p people want to get behind when they have data to support, hey, we're getting behind this great black school. But how do schools like mine, where we have great classrooms, but we don't have resources, how do we get resources? How do we get funding? How do we get it? And is there a network that can help support our types of schools? Yeah, yeah. That's such an important question. I mean, th this to me is one of the things that, that uh, okay, no, no, you go ahead. <laughs> I'm glad she's here. Uh, this, this is one of the things that we've got to make sure happens in ESSA implementation is that the schools that are struggling should be getting an infusion of additional resources, right? And what I worry about is in many of the state plans, it's not clear that they're going to do that at all. And what we know is that in many communities, even within districts, fewer resources are going to the schools serving the highest needs kids. We did an analysis when I was at the department um, of New York City. We found there was a neighborhood in Brooklyn where you could go 10 blocks, a school serving largely affluent students was spending 30% more than a school 10 blocks away serving almost entirely low income students within district. Right, so ESSA gives states both tools and the responsibility to get more resources to the highest needs schools. But I worry that unless we are vigilant and organized, that won't happen. I also, th I also think we've got to 
get much more honest as a country about the, the financial choices we are making. Vice, Vice President Biden would always say, you know, don't tell me what your values are, show me your budget and I'll know what your values are. And the, the reality is what we've done is we, we are willing, right, we are, we're willing as a country to spend $100,000 to keep someone in prison, but we're not willing to spend another ten or fifteen thousand dollars on them while they're in school to have them get a high quality education so they don't end up in prison. So we're not actually saving money. We're just being short-sighted and we're acting out I think a set of values that lift up mass incarceration rather than lifting up education. Hi, um, I've given Arnie Duncan a talking to once, and uh, when Betsy DeVos called me on Teacher Appreciation Day, I hung up on her. So I will be nicer to you, I promise, because I think that you were the best leader we've had in education for a while. We have probably all been in a school at a time when one of our people above us, a supervisor or someone, is someone who hates us and does not appreciate our work. And I think we are all in that position now with our Secretary of Education. However, we can't promote our profession, we can't save our children without working with them. Can you give us some strategies of how we can do good work with the Department of Ed and reach into that department to continue the good work that was coming out under you because I don't want to see it all disappear. But we don't have a leader to tell us how to do it. Yeah. Easy question, huh? Yeah, <laughs> wow. Um, Thank you, by the way, for the things that you've written. And I just want to appreciate you and the voice that you bring in this community. So, uh, um, I, I think we're at a moment where we have to be careful that we don't trade, as, as Nicole Hannah-Jones has written, that we don't trade uh, civility for justice. So I, I, I want to acknowledge I am struggling with this question myself, right? Because when you have an administration that dismantles civil rights enforcement, when you have an administration that takes babies, literally babies, from the arms of their parents to imprison them separately, you have to speak out. And so I think we, we have to hold two things in, in mind. We have to speak out forcefully, aggressively, loudly, persistently on the injustices being inflicted by this administration. Um, and, and, and let me be clear, that is not a partisan point. Like, I don't, I don't think taking babies from, from their parents is a partisan issue, right? So. So we've got to speak out forcefully. And then, I think we also have to, I think you're right, the Education Department has an important function, an important set of roles, and they are an important player in this space. And so we have to push the, leader, the political leadership there to do the right thing. We also have to stay in communication with the career folks who will be there through, you know, into the next administration that may be very different, um, because they are there to do the public's work, right? And, and they are committed public servants. And so we, we need the department to make sure the Title I dollars arrive. We need to make sure that the Title II dollars arrive. When they put out a grant competition for grants to do great science, technology, engineering, and math work, we can't say, well, we're not gonna apply to that grant because it's coming from an administration we don't like. We should go, we definitely should apply for that grant and try to put those dollars to use to advance um, social justice. So I, I think we've got to find some way to hold both things. And then, look, I'm an educator. I'm, you know, I've been very disappointed, uh, to say the least, um, by Secretary DeVos's decisions up until this moment. Um, but I believe people can learn. And I, I think it's important you know, for us to, to get, invite her to visit public schools, to spend time with public school teachers, public school students, public school parents, and to keep telling our story and to try to teach 
you know, and, and we got to just keep trying to, to hope that she and the people around her um, will be willing to listen and learn. Um, and even if they're not, we got to just keep trying uh, with the hope that, that something will break through at some moment, that hearing from uh, a teacher about what it's like to work three jobs because you're not being paid enough will shift their thinking about about issues of compensation or hearing from a young person about what it is like to be a transgender student in a school to be harassed day after day and denied an education what that's like and maybe that will be the thing that finally moves them thank you so much and Jamila's make and I think in the words of our former first lady you know when they go low we have to stay high we have to start where we are do what we can and use what we got because we can't wait for them. And like President Obama said, we are who we've been waiting for, so. Absolutely. Absol thank you. This conversation is, like I am, it's a tweet storm going on. So <laughs> make sure you're engaging in that. Like write it down, tweet it later. But do we have three more? Three more questions? Is there anyone, anyone else with questions? Question. Okay, we got one. Is there any more? Anyone else that would like to ask a question? I'm really good at wait time. Okay, all right, we got two. No, we did. She's waiting. We get appropriate wait time. Okay. <laughs> okay, and our final two questions will come from right. um, Khalisa and Tony. Uh, we had so many good ones that we did not ask. So, um, I, ooh, I'm gonna ask this one. All right, so the mission of the U US Department of Ed is to promote student achievement and prepare for global competitiveness by fostering educational excellence and ensuring equal access. With such a robust mission statement, what would be the impact upon public education if there were no US Department of Education? Look, you know, I. This goes back to the point about, you know, budgets are value statements. I believe there is a federal responsibility to protect the civil rights of students. That is the job of the education department. And if you look over the history of the department, when the department has been most effective, it has been as a champion advocate for civil rights protection. You know, I think about uh, a district that we worked with in the Midwest where there was a complaint that uh, Latino students were underrepresented in the STEM programs in this district. We did an investigation. The reason they were underrepresented is the information only went home in English. If your parents were not English speakers, you did not even, they, they, they didn't even know that these STEM programs existed. We got the district to change that practice to get that information to families in order to change who had access to that opportunity. That is the kind of work that the department needs to do. Uh, there, are, there are kids um, who were uh, being harassed and bullied in their school because of their LGBTQ status, and the department's civil rights enforcement intervened on their behalf with their district to change that, and to make it so those kids could take advantage of the educational opportunity. That's the job of the department. There are folks who would like that, that civil rights enforcement not to exist, uh, to me, that is morally, ethically uh, unacceptable. And so uh, the first reason to defend the department is because of the, that civil rights role. But the second reason is there is a lot of federal money that goes into education. And we have to make sure that that money actually gets to students. Um, you know, one of the... One of the things that I'm most horrified by, and there are many, but one of the things I'm most horrified by on this particular issue of, of, of watching the money uh, at the department over the last uh, year and a half is there was, some in the room may be familiar with this trend for many years of for-profit colleges that were stealing taxpayer dollars. They were taking advantage of students, they were defrauding students, they were telling students, you know, take this program, you'll be able to get uh, this certificate and get a job in this area when it wasn't true or those jobs didn't exist. Um, they were 
systematically stealing, particularly from low-income students, particularly students of color, particularly working moms of color, um, on the order of billions of dollars. And we spend an extraordinary amount of time, particularly in the second term, focused on accountability for those dollars, trying to make sure that we protect students from being taken advantage of and protect taxpayers from having their money stolen, particularly Pell Grants stolen. Uh, I mean, horrific stories. We had a story of a school where uh, a veteran who had the GI Bill had severe, uh, severe brain trauma. And the recruiter came to the hospital bed to get the veteran to sign up for this school so that they could take the GI Bill money, even though the student would never be able to benefit. So we did a lot to try and enforce the rules against those schools, and the executives of those companies are now in charge of higher education policy at the department, and the department is systematically dismantling all of those protections we have put in place. So the other reason we need the department is to make sure, again, that the dollars are well used, responsibly used, get to the, get to the students who need them most. It looks like that we are out of time, almost. Are we good? We have one more? Well, my question has to do with the shortage of black male educators. And you mentioned it in your presentation earlier about the value that we, as black male educators, can bring to uh, the educational process for all students. Would you talk a little bit about um, what Ed Trust is doing in that regard? and what other resources uh, are provided by EdTrust. Yeah, so, you know, I mentioned these reports that we've done, the perspective of teachers of color, because one of our worries is that even in districts where the new teacher recruit pool is diverse, we then see teachers leaving uh, in disproportionate numbers, teachers of color leaving, because they don't feel supported. You know, I, I think this issue of the lack of black male teachers, we have about 2% of our teachers are African American men as a country. Uh, it's sort of at the, it, it's at the crossroads of a bunch of things that we've talked about. If you at four years old are sent home from school, right, because of exclusionary discipline policies, are you gonna wanna be a teacher? Right, if you go to a school K through 12, and you never see African-American authors, you never learn about uh, the contributions of African-Americans in, in the history of the country, are you gonna wanna be a teacher? Right? If you then are underrepresented in advanced coursework in your school, so you don't have access to algebra in middle school, you don't have access to um, AP classes and international baccalaureate classes, you're repeatedly told you're not good enough to be in these classes and you never see teachers who look like you teaching math, then are you going to want to be a teacher, right? So if, if we want to change this, we have, to, we have to change a whole set of practices. Should we have targeted recruitment programs to try to get high school students and college students, particularly students of color, particularly men of color, into teaching? Absolutely. And there are some folks around the country doing great work. I think about uh, Sharif el Mekki and the work he, he's doing uh, with the fellowship. Just extraordinary to try to provide mentoring and encouragement to young people to get into teaching and stay in teaching. We should absolutely do that. But I think this problem is going to be with us unless we change the system as a whole. And we've got to make it um, much more possible for young people of color to see themselves in the teacher workforce to see and to see school as a place where they are loved and welcomed and supported uh, and where their identity is loved and welcomed and supported. That, that to me is what's necessary to move the conversation. I also know we, we have, we have um, uh, Jose and folks from edu EduColor represented in the room, and I just want to also lift up the importance of communities of support. I mean, part of what we're committed to at EdTrust is that, again, we have to make sure that we retain folks, and part of what's going to retain folks is feeling like they are part of a community, and Jose has created that with EduColor. Uh, Sharif is doing that with the fellowship. We need many more efforts like that around the country.
So, just on behalf of everybody here, um, just want to deeply thank you. Thank you for um, your authenticity and just being such an advocate for the profession, for teachers, and for continuing the work. And um, I myself can say I'm deeply honored to share this space with you. And I'm going to pass it off to Tony. I as well would like to say thank you. This is my first in story conference. And uh, I have been energized to do some things differently when I go back home. And then to have been asked to share the stage with you and Kalisa, this is just an awesome uh, memory that I will always have. And I appreciate your transparency. And I appreciate the fact that you are a brother. <laughs> and, um, and I mean that in this manner, that you are someone that I can look up to and I can thrive to and strive to, uh, to join you in, the, in the, the journey. And I just want to say thank you. Thank you, Instoy, for allowing me this opportunity as well. <laughs>